Marshall. Snakes, huh? Uh, not a fan. <laughs> not a fan. Nothing ever good happens when snakes come to God's people. <laughs> it's not good. <laughs> Pretty sure in heaven there's no snakes. I can't say for sure, but... Or, or, or spiders, or mosquitoes, or 114 degree days. Please, God, please. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> Uh, but you're here uh, inside this nice, cooled uh, building, or you're inside of your house, hopefully, uh, inside your cooled house, or wherever you may be watching. I don't know if there's anybody outside today. I didn't, I didn't peek, but maybe there's a few out there, but uh, you're brave. It's kind of sticky out there today, too, but anyway, there's always a few brave people outside. Um, if you need a Bible today, please put up your hand. Our greeters will bring you a Bible 20 years, and uh, yeah, you may not have been here at the beginning for the first 20, but you're, you are here at the beginning of the second 20. So uh, you imagine what God's going to do in the next 20 years? That's, that's amazing to think of, huh? It's been fun to watch and see what he's done over the last 20. Boy, I was really young when this church started. <laughs> I can guarantee you I won't be around as your pastor in the next 20 years. <laughs> you know, when, when we get to 20, that would be 72. You think so? Maybe I'll be par Pastor Emeritus by that time or something like that. We're, we're going to need someone young to come in by that point for sure. But uh, anyway, enough about that. Let's get into the Word today. We've been uh, continuing in our study, the book of Acts. We're almost done, but, uh, you know, there's still a couple really neat things that are going to happen uh, in the last couple chapters, and so if you have that Bible, let's open it to chapter 26. We're going to be reading through the entire chapter today. Last week, uh, Pastor DJ did a great job um, introducing us to King Agrippa, the Jewish king, and his lovely wife, Bernice. <laughs> And if you were here last week, I used that word lovely very facetiously. Uh, she was, I think, anything but lovely, um, as DJ was uh, describing her to us. Um, the Roman governor, the background now is that the Roman governor Festus is about to send Paul to Rome to be tried in front of Caesar. But before he goes, it sparks the interest of the Jewish king Agrippa, he wants to hear from this Paul because he's been causing quite a stir. And so now Paul has this additional opportunity before he leaves to uh, once again tell his story and to explain the gospel to these dignitaries and everyone else that's hanging around within the sound of his voice. And so it's a, a great opportunity for him and for God. And it's a super cool passage that has been, um, you know, saved over all of these 2,000 years for us to have today. As we go through it, I want you just to think about that a little bit. Like, isn't it amazing that we have this interaction between King Agrippa and Paul, and we get to actually hear what Paul says and how he describes his own testimony once again. So let's jump in. And I have a nice little outline for you today. If you'd like to take notes, um, mostly you're disappointed when I preach because I don't necessarily have like a lot of outlines. I don't necessarily do that a lot. But um, today's your lucky day. There's a really detailed outline if you want to <laughs> jot things down. So the first point, and it's going to be A, B, C, D. So you'll see those coming up on the screen. The first one, the background here is Paul's pedigree. He's going to explain his pedigree as he... Uh, starts to talk to King Agrippa. So let's look at verse 1. So Agrippa said to Paul, you have permission to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and made his defense. I consider myself fortunate that it is before you, King Agrippa, that I'm going to make my defense today against all the accusations of the Jews, especially because you are familiar with all of the customs and controversies of the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. 
my manner of life from my youth, spent from the beginning among my own nation and in Jerusalem, is known by all the Jews. They have known for a long time, if they are willing to testify, that according to the strictest party of our religion, I have lived as a Pharisee. And now I stand here on trial because of my hope in the promise made by God to our fathers, to which our twelve tribes hope to attain as they earnestly worship night and day. And for this hope, I am accused by Jews, O king. Why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth, and I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme. And in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. We'll stop right there. So basically, Paul's introduction to the speech here is he's saying, if I can summarize, like, I'm one of you. I'm one of, I'm one of the Jews. I'm not this outsider who's coming to kind of wreck Judaism. No, I was raised the same as you. I've gone through all of the same studies of the scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures as you. In fact, even as I'm being persecuted today, I used to be in your shoes persecuting Christians, even putting them to death. Until, of course, Jesus did something miraculous in my life to completely change the direction of my life. And he's going to get to that later. But before we get to that, Paul makes one huge point in verse 8. It's our second point today, and he identifies the controversy. He really puts his finger on it, like, King Agrippa, let me just summarize why I'm here and what these accusations are against me. And it's in verse 8 that we read previously. I'll read it again. Why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? So he's saying that even the Pharisees, those that are accusing me today, they also believe that a Messiah will be sent from God and he will rise from the dead. They believe in the resurrection of the dead and he will be the first fruits that all will rise who follow after him. But the issue is, and the problem is, and the whole controversy about me, Paul says, is they simply fail to see and believe that Jesus of Nazareth is that Messiah that they wait for. So let's continue. Um, and here comes a little recollection of Paul's conversion experience to, as he turned to follow Jesus. So look at verse 12. In this connection, what connection? Well, the connection to him going to foreign cities to persecute Christians, I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, that shone around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. We'll stop there. So we've heard this story a couple different times. First, when it really happened, and then Paul telling it a couple different times as we've been going through the book of Acts. This is the Damascus Road conversion experience. Saul, it uses his former name here, Saul, before he uh, had his name changed to Paul, he was on his way to Damascus, to Syria, as he was saying, to persecute some of the Christians that were running away, trying to get away from the persecution. Well, he was going after them. When Jesus literally showed up on that road and changed everything for Paul. Changed everything. Notice Jesus uses this phrase, which, interestingly, um, Paul has told this story a couple different times in the book of Acts, but only here does he give us the additional detail of Jesus saying this phrase. 
it is hard for you to kick against the goads. What in the world does that mean? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. That's the bonus question for today. <laughs> what does that mean? Actually, it's pretty simple once you understand um, what it is actually referring to. It's a phrase from Greek literature that refers to oxen who are being herded or who are being, you know, put to plow the fields, put in the, the yoke to plow the fields, and the goad is this long rod, this long pole with a sharpened end on it, like with a, a prick on the end. Like, so I've got something like that. I couldn't, um, I didn't have an actual goad lying around the house. <laughs> But I do have uh, a fire poker, or whatever they call this. And um, so, but it's not exactly like this, but if you could picture a long, probably wooden pole, um, I don't know, 15, 12, 15 feet or so, and then one of these at the end of it. And so how this would be used, and you could see how effective this could be, <laughs> is that as the oxen were being led... Uh, the herdsmen would have this sticky pole, and if they were going in the right direction and doing what they were supposed to do, they would be led without causing much pain or, you know, without really using the goad. But if they were to kick against the goad, kick against or try to go in a different direction or to stop going where they're supposed to go, guess what would happen? Right? Ouch! Right? Right in the Boop, right in the behind, right? They would get, they would get this stick. <laughs> I wasn't sure how that would go, but. <laughs> Jesus was using the same phrase as he speaks to Paul here. He's saying, Paul, you got to stop kicking against the goat. Stop, stop kicking and rebelling against the direction that I'm leading you in. It's useless to do that because it's only going to hurt, right? It's only going to be worse for you. Now, it's not as if God was going to actually pierce, you know, Paul with an instrument if he didn't do the right thing. But the point is that, hey, it's always going to be a better life, more satisfying, more fulfilling, not easier, but more fulfilling, right? more God-glorifying when we go the direction that God wants us to go. Do the things that God wants us to do rather than trying to kick against the goads. We're going to move on, but I want you to remember this image, remember this phrase, because I'm going to come back to it right at the end. All right? So, next we pick up on Paul explaining his mission to the king. So let's keep reading in verse uh, 15. And I said, who? so here he is on the road to Damascus. Jesus is showing up in this bright light. Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand to your feet. Here's the mission. For I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you. The Gentiles to whom I am sending you, he says. To open the eyes, to open their eyes, so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by, are sanctified by faith in me. Wow, what powerful words God is speaking here to Paul as he's laying out his mission. So Paul is telling King Agrippa and the crowd that is there that his mission is to be a messenger primarily to the Gentiles. Just as a rem reminder, that term Gentiles simply means non-Jews, right? Non-Jewish people. That's what the, the phrase Gentiles, the word Gentiles means. 
And then Paul gives us something very, very valuable here. Actually, like I mentioned, it's actually Jesus saying these things. He says, not only here is your mission, but let me explain what your mission will accomplish. Jesus is about to tell us what the gospel, what the good news of Jesus accomplishes in people's lives. These, these are amazing, amazing words for us to have directly from Jesus through, through Paul here. So this is what the gospel will accomplish. Jesus isn't going to give an exhaustive list, of course, here. There's so much more, but he summarizes these things. And you can see them. I put them on this um, slide here. Actually, I think it's uh, over two, two slides, maybe. But anyway, let me just go through each one of them. So the first one is that the, go the gospel accomplishes opening their eyes. So this isn't talking about physically, of course. Now, Jesus did open the eyes physically of many different people to sort of illustrate the fact that I'm opening the eyes of people spiritually. And here he's talking about opening people's eyes spiritually. Because all of us, because of our sin and rebellion against God, we are born into spiritual blindness. It means that who we really are on the... This is just flesh, a tent, right? This is just the fleshy part, the physical part, which will go away one day and go into the ground. But the soul, the spirit of who we really are on the inside, that, that is what exists for eternity. And that is the part that, because of our sin, is unable to see God for who he is. Our soul or our spirit is blind to God. However, the gospel accomplishes the eyes of our spirit opening up for us to be able to see and receive God and his love. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers. You see that? To keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. I don't know, do you, have, do you have that friend or family member in your life that you, you keep sharing the gospel with them and you keep sharing the difference that Jesus has made in your life? You, you keep trying to explain that, you know, Jesus is the Savior and they need to receive Jesus as their Savior as well and you keep talking about it, but it just seems like they're just completely blinded to it. They just, they can't see it. Yeah, and that is because they are blind to it, Right? That's what Jesus is explaining here. They actually are spiritually blinded. But one of the first miracles of the gospel taking root in someone's life is that God opens the eyes of their spirit, of their soul, to be able to see the truth of God. That's, by the way, what we should be praying for for our lost friend or family member, God, would you please do the miracle of opening the eyes of their spirit, their soul? Next, the gospel takes a person from darkness to light. Again, this is a spiritual reference, and it's fairly similar to the previous one, being spiritually blind and then being able to, to see again. But, you know, in the darkness is where we are lost and experience only evil. But when Christ, it, through the gospel, brings us to light, that is when we are found and where we can be made holy. From darkness to light. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous what? Into his marvelous light. Amen. Glory to God. Next, Jesus says that the gospel brings us from being under the power and influence of Satan to now being experiencing the power of God. Sometimes it may seem to you a little drastic, uh, a little maybe overdramatic to depict people who are not in Christ as people who are under 
the influence or under the power of Satan. But this is exactly the way Jesus puts it. There is no neutral ground. If you're not in Christ, you are tragically still lost in sin and under the power and influence of the evil one. But the finished work of Jesus on the cross and through the empty tomb takes us from being lost and trapped in sin and under the power of Satan into the light of Christ where we are now under the power and influence of God himself. Glory to God. This is getting good. Next is the one really that we, we talk about probably most often, and that is the, the good news of the gospel brings forgiveness of sin. Forgiveness of sin. Psalm 103, verse 12 says, As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Boy, I need to remember that sometimes, don't you? Don't you need to be reminded that no, that sin is gone. Like God's not holding that over you anymore. You are free from that as far as the east is from the west, which is how far? I don't know, but pretty far, right? Like as far as you can ever imagine. That's how far gone that sin is in God's mind. Wow. Forgiveness of sin. And finally, Jesus says that the gospel provides formerly unsaved people, and here's the way he puts it, a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So that is a less familiar way of saying that it is through faith in Christ that we are saved and now are being sanctified. I love it. So that is some of the explanation from Jesus himself on the beautiful things that happen in the life of one who receives the good news of Jesus. And that was the mission that Paul was given, to preach that good news to everybody that he comes in contact with. Now, question. And this is a softball question. This, this should be pretty easy. How does Paul's mission differ from our mission? It doesn't. It doesn't, does it? It doesn't. He may not have appeared on a road to a certain city in a bright light to you, but in some way he appeared to you. And when he appeared to you and you gave your life over to God, in repentance of sin and received the, the free forgiveness and salvation from God, he then from that day forward sent you on a mission, the same mission that Paul is sent on, to take that good news that we just talked about to everybody around us. How are we doing on that mission, by the way? How are we doing on that mission? So after talking about his conversion, after talking about his mission... Paul now returns to tell King Agrippa a little bit about some of the, the defense that he has against the accusations. So he moves into God, um, his, Paul's defense. Um, verse 19. Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and then throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. For this reason, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. To this day, I have had the help that comes from God, and so I stand here testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass, that the Christ must suffer, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. So his defense is very, very simple. He simply says, I obeyed God, <laughs> right? God spoke to me, Jesus told me what to do, and I have been doing it. Nothing more, nothing less, that is my defense. I've been making the Messiah known. Just like you all would be, you know. He doesn't say this, but he infers it, just like you all would be if you actually believed that Jesus was the real Messiah. Tragically, you're blinded to it right now. Well, the next verse is a little unfortunate. Here comes the governor, 
the Roman governor, Festus, and he's going to open his big mouth and interrupt and interject. Um, and he says this in verse 24. And as he was saying these things, so he interrupted him, right? Didn't even wait. Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you're out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. I mean, the, the whole point here is that Paul is, is addressing the king. He's not even really directly addressing uh, the governor, the Roman governor here, but he decides to open his big mouth anyway. And by the way, that Greek phrase for uh, loud voice, he said in a loud voice, that's the Greek phrase from which we get in the English megaphone. <laughs> megaphone. You ever been around here um, Sunday nights when DJ is on the megaphone trying to talk to all of the high schoolers that are all out there, right? That's what Festus was doing. Big mouth Festus. He opens up his megaphone <laughs> and he interjects um, and says he's crazy. But Paul kind of just dismisses the interruption and continues on pressing the king towards considering faith in Jesus. Look at verse 25 now. But Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I am speaking true and rational words. For the king knows about these things, and to him I speak boldly. For I am persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice, for this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. And Agrippa said to Paul, in a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? <laughs> Unfortunately, despite Paul's best efforts, King Agrippa is not ready to surrender his life over to Jesus. Do you think that you can convince me in this short of a time to become a Christian? And with that rhetorical question, the king reveals his rejection of Jesus. But Paul, undeterred, he picks up on those words that the king uses and, and presses forward and gives his ultimate desire for all people. Look at verse 29. And Paul said, well, whether short or long, I would that God... I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. So whether it takes a short time or a long time, <laughs> the time isn't the most important thing. The most important thing is I want everybody to be as I am, meaning saved from sin in a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. I wish that everyone could know what I know and be like I am, except, of course, for the fact that I'm a prisoner, right? He doesn't wish that on everybody. Well, here comes the, uh, the outcome as things wrap up. They're seeing Paul as innocent, but unfortunately, the plan is already being him being sent to Rome. Look at verse 30. Then the king rose and the governor and Bernice and those who were sitting with him them and when they had withdrawn they said to one another this man is done is doing nothing to deserve death or imprisonment wow and Agrippa said to Festus this man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar wow what an amazing Interaction uh, we get to see here today between Paul and, and King Agrippa. But as I promised, I want to return back to something that we, we looked at before with the, the goad, or sometimes called the ox goad. Um, Jesus said, It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Hopefully, the Holy Spirit is uh, speaking to your heart today and bringing many uh, different applications of this passage to your life, many different challenges, uh, whatever it may be. But, but I, I really just felt so strongly 
uh, an urge from the Holy Spirit in my preparation to really focus on, on this as an application for our lives today. And I can't help but think that there's many of us, preacher included, that needs to hear this challenge today. Remember that the picture is that the herdsman has this pokey goad, and as the ox are, as the oxen are going in the right direction that he's leading them, if they keep moving where they're supposed to be going, then, then they don't need to feel the, the angry tip of the ox goad, right? They can just freely go in the direction that they're supposed to be going. But as soon as they decide to kick back against it, kick against the goads, or decide that they want to just stop, or they want to just go in a different direction, then they're going to feel this. And it's going to be a little bit more painful. They may end up going there in the end, but it's going to be a little bit more painful. And for Paul, it was a, a sharp reminder. <laughs> yes, a sharp reminder that it's going to be better to go in the way that Jesus is directing you, Paul. You've been fighting against me, right? You've been persecuting me. You've been persecuting Christians. But now I am calling you. There is a call on your life, Paul. I'm laying before you your destiny. Go in the way that you should be going. It's going to be a lot better for you instead of trying to kick against it or to refuse or to disobey or to try to go your own way because then you're going to feel this not a literal poke in your back but life's always going to be better going Jesus way right when we don't we feel that darkness that turmoil inside stress pain misery sometimes we might call it depression or darkness or whatever, when we're just not quite going in the steps that Jesus has for us. We just sang that song today, wherever you lead me, whatever it costs me, all I want is you, right? I just want to go your direction. And I think the application for us today is pretty simple for us to understand But I wonder if we will actually hear that today, hear what the Holy Spirit is speaking to us. What is God calling you to do today? What direction is he leading you? What is he trying to speak into your life today? What is he trying to steer you away from What's he trying to pull you back from? No, no, not that direction. No, no, turn, turn from that. That's not honoring to me what you're doing. I don't want you to go in, go in this direction with me. It's going to be so much better. What is that for you as you just take a minute to think about it? Because I know for all of us, we feel the ox goad from time to time. We just do because we're not perfect yet, right? We're still in the process of being sanctified. Our sin nature is still with us. I feel it. I'm not always doing exactly what God wants me to do, and I feel it. It sucks. It feels bad, right? Maybe I can get medication for it, or I don't know. Maybe I just need, need to see somebody, or maybe I just need to get away, or I need a vacation. And sometimes we do need those things, but most of the time we just need to go the direction that God is calling us to go. I just feel really strongly today that that's the call. What is it that Jesus is showing up in your life and showing you and teaching you and guiding you and calling you to and calling you away from? What is those things? What's that sin area that he's saying, get out of there right now? What are those things? It's time to stop kicking against the goats. It's time to start going God's way. And I don't know about you, but sometimes when I'm faced with that, 
it is so heavy and difficult that I'm not sure that I can do that on my own. And the truth is that I can't. In God's power, I can do that. But you know what I often need? Often I need other of God's people to come around me and to put their arm around me and to pray for God's power to be revealed in my life to actually get me to go in the direction and do that thing that God wants me to do. And so what we're going to do as we have a worship time, uh, two worship songs to conclude our gathering today, I, I hope that you don't, you know, the sermon's over so we can now get to lunch. No, can we just have a time of prayer down here today? Um, I want to just open up the prayer altar, but today, rather than just having you pray on your own, I feel like for today's subject, for what we're trying to break away from what Satan is trying to do in our lives and to try to go God's way, we need another brother or sister in Christ to come alongside us. We need someone to pray for us and over us for this thing. And so as we begin to sing, I'm going to be down here, and my wife Tracy's going to come down here, and we have pastors and elders that are ready to hop up and come and pray with you as you come down to the front today. And you just need to tell us, what is that, what is that thing that we can pray for God's power to come and to take you in that direction, to finally let you make that right decision, or to, to, to proactively obey, or to proactively go and you know, fulfill the destiny that God's calling you to, whatever it might be, there's a myriad of things. But I just sense that if, if this is for you, then the Holy Spirit's going to be speaking to you. I would love for you to come down here and let's do this as a church family today. We need each other. Let's come and have someone pray over you and send you out with the power of God so powerfully upon you, filled with the Holy Spirit of God to take on that thing and to embrace whatever it is that God is calling us to. Amen? Does that sound good? Are you ready for that? So let me pray. And, um, and when I finish praying and, and the song begins, um, if God's calling you, please don't say no. Let's take some time and have some prayer down here. So, Father, we uh, thank you for this passage, first of all. I, I, it's just so amazing to me that we, 2,000 years later, still have this passage of, of the Apostle Paul, who writes most of the New Testament, and we get to hear his words as he shares the gospel with with the, uh, the Jewish king and, and he tells us what you actually said directly to him as you showed up in this bright light and God I pray that you would be showing up to each one of us right now and that there would be ways in which you are directing us things that you're speaking to us and God help us to not kick against the goads any longer to say no now is the time to follow you in obedience whatever that call is whatever you need wherever you call wherever you want me to go however you want me to act however who is it that you that I need to be going to share the gospel with that I've been reluctant I've been kicking against the goads even though you've been telling me that you want me to go to that person and to share Jesus with them and I've been telling you no, and I've been looking for ways out. And I need the power of God so I can say yes right now. So God, if you're moving, then give us an opportunity to pray for one another today. That together we might invoke the power of God to do things in us that we just can't do in our own strength. We love you, and we give you glory today. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said what? Amen. Amen.